this lecture concerns the U.S. home front in World War II. So basically we're talking about 1942, 43, 44, and 45. The U.S. mobilized again, as it had in World War I, for total war. That is, uh, uh, Pearl Harbor overcame our initial neutrality and isolationism. Um, it made the neutrality acts uh, void. The America First Committee, as we discussed earlier, um, dissolved itself um, immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor within just a couple of days. Um, we focused all of our energy on prosecuting the war. And because we were, uh, as a nation, involved in the war for more than the 19 months of World War I, then it was this war, rather than World War I, that profoundly altered the way we thought about the role of government in our uh, personal lives. Um, World War I, uh, had done this. The Progressive Era had begun the process. World War I was, a, was a, a catalyst for some of this. The Great Depression was a catalyst. And World War II um, finally put us over the edge uh, for uh, adopting many of the concepts of government, positive government, um, that the progressives had advocated. Um, one of the things that we did was to create a war bureaucracy uh, when we applied all of our resources to prosecuting what was, in essence, a two-front war uh, overseas in both cases, we had to uh, have a massive logistical presence and the ability to turn out large amounts of war personnel and war material. And the only way that we uh, uh, felt like we could do this on short notice was by creating this war bureaucracy. We created many, many government agencies. For example, the War Industries Board, um, probably being uh, the most important to the overall economy, then uh, gathered in the industrial resources and allocated industrial resources um, to various kinds of war material production. It controlled, for all intents and purposes, the manufacturing industries of the United States. Uh, the Office of Price Administration basically did the same thing for, um, uh, for, for consuming uh, of goods. It controlled inflation by controlling um, uh, how, how many goods people could buy. Um, and it did this through rationing, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, the good thing about the war, if you can ever say there's anything good about a war, is that it forced the economy to snap out of depression. And economic output doubled between 1941 and 1945. This not only ended the Great Depression in, in pretty much one fell swoop, but it inaugurated the longest history of prosperity in U.S. history. That is from 1941 until 1968, and maybe a little further. The armed forces employed 15 million people. That is the, the military forces uh, that you see arrayed here, as well as the merchant marine and women's uh, military forces, waves and wax. The home front itself changed um, because of World War II. There had been a shared sense of purpose prior to war, World War II, but industrialization, immigration, uh, the Great Depression had in some cases strengthened that, but in many cases fragmented it. The, uh, the war, because it was um, uh, one in which we shared a common unambiguous enemy who had attacked us first, or had declared war on us before we declared war on them, in the case of Germany and Italy, um, then they, they were unambiguous. We, we didn't have um, a, a, a problem. We knew who the enemy was, and we knew why we were fighting them. Um, everyone shared shortages and rationing. The Office of Price Administration 
um, controlled rationing. There had been shortages almost immediately um, of, of goods, uh, particularly consumer goods. Uh, there began to be rationing in order to um, in order to be able to to send more goods to the front. Now this is much more draconian than it had been uh, in World War One, in which we did not have rationing. But in this case, we needed more than just um, more than just food stuff uh, to uh, supply our troops, who were more and more and more mechanized. Uh, we needed industrial goods as well. Um, one of the things about rationing was that if you considered yourself to be a law-abiding person or even a non-criminal member of the community, then you shared in the shortage, regardless of how much money you had, because you could not get more goods than you had ration stamps. The only alternative was to go onto the black market. And most, most Americans simply did not do that. Another uh, thing that gave us a sense of shared purpose as Americans um, was the pitching in on scrap drives and war bond drives. Let me say, I I've, I've, see that I've skipped a note here. Let me go back up to uh, shortages and rationing. Um, we began rationing gasoline in 1942, not because there was a shortage of gasoline, but because there was a shortage of tire rubber. And if you couldn't get gasoline, you couldn't drive your cars. Um, and by 1942, uh, most people had not, no longer had access to horse, horses or mules. Um, sugar, meat, and coffee, probably the big three in most people's diets at the time, was rationed to beginning in 1943. Okay, um, we, we pitched in on the war effort to collect scrap metal, to collect rubber. Um, this, this happened every few months. And we pitched in on uh, war bond drives for both large buyers and small buyers. Um, we learned through the Liberty Loan campaign, the Liberty Loan campaigns of World War I, that small purchasers wanted to feel a part of, um, uh, of, of the patriotism and the acts of, of goodness, you might say. Um, and so in World War II, we established a small buyer program in which people didn't buy liberty bonds, excuse me, war bonds um, directly, but they bought stamps every week that they put into a stamp book. And when they filled that stamp book, uh, they could turn it in for a war bond. Um, I remember doing this as a child in the 1960s to um, get savings bonds, which re replaced war bonds, which had replaced themselves liberty bonds. Uh, one of the things that happened on the war front was that citizens increased their mobility, much like um, um, people had moved from the south to the northern cities or from uh, rural areas to urban areas uh, to, to pursue industrial jobs in World War I. We saw um, a, a huge increase of that in World War II, and we saw large movement of people to uh, California and to other warm areas like the U.S. South, primarily in order to, um, to participate in uh, year-round aircraft production activities. Um, the defense, uh, what we would call defense now, the uh, war-making capability, uh, war-making industries, uh, war material industries um, tended to locate in places that had milder climates than they did in the north. Older factories often retooled, um, but regardless, people found jobs all over the U.S. where there had been very few jobs uh, before. And Southern California in particular uh, developed because of the um, defense industry. We also see an increase in uh, education, both in the desire for education and the need for education. Um, the way we prosecuted the war uh, in the 1940s was technologically. Um, we, we thought of science and technology as the key to victory, and this science and technology gave us the impetus toward 
book learning. It increased the status of book learning. Increased prosperity also allowed more kids to stay in school longer, and it allowed some students to go back to school. But it's really uh, the post-war initiatives like the GI Bill of 1944 that made uh, education credentials important. You can blame the, the universal need for a high school diploma on the GI Bill. You can just about blame the, the emerging universal need for a bachelor's degree on the GI Bill of 1944. We'll talk more about the GI Bill and increased educational opportunities and increased prosperity um, in, in a later lecture. One of the dark stains on uh, the U.S. home front was the internment of Japanese Americans after February 19, 1942 with uh, Franklin Roosevelt's executive order 9066 because the Japanese military had bombed Pearl Harbor, mass hysteria, and a long-seated hatred, that's the only word we can use for it, um, of the Japanese along the West Coast led the federal government to insist that between 100,000 and 120,000 Nisai, that is Americans born of Japanese parents, 60% of whom were American citizens, were rounded up, forced to sell their land and it, which was kind of a boondoggle to uh, California landowners, uh, particularly rural um, large farm landowners, uh, and then relocated to uh, concentration camps in Wyoming, Arizona, places they had never lived before. Uh, and in 1983, the U.S. government apologized for this uh, tremendous violation of civil liberties, uh, and in 1988, all of the living internees were paid $20,000 each. Um, many, many Japanese who were uh, Japanese Americans who were who were either not rounded up or uh, were able to um, um, enlist their way out of uh, the camps. Then went on to form military units. Um, there were a number of. Uh, these military units that performed extremely well in uh, particularly the Italian campaign of 1943-1944. You may be puzzled by this idea that only 60% of the Nisai were uh, American citizens. Uh, part of this is because they were, were not, the Nisai were not necessarily born in the United States. Their, one of their parents may have been born in the United States. And so by the Japanese, they were considered Nisai. Um, also, these odd agreements that we had and restrictions that we had on Japanese immigration made the uh, application of the 14th Amendment to the Japanese uh, and the idea that any, any person born in the U.S. was a citizen was, was pretty problematic uh, with the Japanese. We did not apply it consistently. Well. With that, we find other groups that have been traditionally marginalized uh, found their way into the limelight and are well remembered uh, in our folklore as well as our art for the actual contributions that they made and made well. And, and one of the most uh, significant of these is women. Women's roles began to change because of World War II, that they fell backwards in the 1950s was a deliberate and concentrated effort on the part of um, government and media to, to, to take women back out of the workforce so that the men returning from, from uh, the Army, Navy, Air, um, there was no Air Force, Marines, um, Merchant Marine could be reintegrated. Uh, into those jobs. Uh, some of this uh, seems reasonable. Most of it was pretty unfair. Um, there were 900,000 women in the military, but the, 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 big, the big change was 
this notion of Rosie the Riveter, which one scholar says really ought to be Wendy the Welder. They didn't rivet as much as they welded. But because of the because of the media at the time, particularly beginning with the Norman Rockwell illustration that you see on the bottom of um, the, the lower illustration of the Hoyden woman in a, uh, in a coverall with a rivet gun in her lap, look closely at the name on her lunchbox. That's uh, uh, Rosie. And this is um, Norman Rockwell's premier and, and quite famous illustration that opened up the notion of Rosie the Riveter as opposed to Wendy the Welder. Now, working class women had almost always worked outside of the home, but Rosie the Riveter changed from being a, a working class woman who, was, who had uh, changed from a service occupation to a manufacturing or a building occupation, as exemplified by this illustration of Rosie the Riveter in the bottom, to middle class women who were being brought into manufacturing in, um, uh, industries. Middle class women did not uh, work outside of the home very frequently. In fact, a signifier of middle class status was that the wife and the children did not work outside of the home. So getting um, middle class women to agree to fill the ranks of needed manufacturing workers was a pretty big propaganda effort. And you can see the upper uh, image here, the we can do it image that you see much more frequently uh, than you do the Rosie the Riveter image is a propaganda poster aimed specifically at middle class women. And you can tell part of this by how clean this woman is. Compare the, the we can do it Rosie to the Rosie the Riveter uh, below. The Rosie the Riveter below is is dirty. She, she, she has dirt on her. She is big. She's brawny. Uh, those were all uh, classic signifiers of working class status. The upper uh, we can do it Rosie is clean, slender. Uh, her hair is, is tucked up. She's a little neater looking um, and she is designed to draw women into um, cleaner manufacturing, primarily into armaments and airplane building. Uh, 17 million women in the United States worked outside the home by 1943, and women increased from 25% in 1940 to 33% in 1945 of the workforce. One third of all workers in the uh, counted workforce were women. And so we're talking primarily about manufacturing jobs by 1945. This would be an issue when we um, uh, had to deal with winding down the war. Another formerly mar marginalized group who continued to be marginalized after the war uh, is African Americans. African Americans used the war as an opportunity to negotiate increased equal rights and to uh, negotiate uh, civil rights. And we can date the mid 20th century upturn in civil rights activity to the war and to uh, the activism and even militancy uh, of African Americans that began with World War II. Um, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, dramatically increased its membership during World War II after being ground pretty much into the dust after uh, World War I. Uh, the Congress on Racial Equality, CORE, was founded in 1942, and it was a more activist organization than the NAACP. It challenged existing law um, with, with a physical presence rather than uh, using the court system to challenge existing law like the NAACP tended to do. Um, ordinary, everyday African Americans frequently engaged in what is called the double V campaign. Uh, v for victory, 
over fascism in Europe and the Pacific, and V for victory over racism, which was a significant component of fascism here in the United States. Uh, the Double V campaign was both subterranean and above ground. That is, it, 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 was, it began as something within the black community, but after a while became well known in the white community uh, and the mainstream uh, community, and it was discussed. Uh, the most potent of these um, activists, however, was A. Philip Randolph, who you see pictured here. Uh, particularly in his March on Washington movement. Philip Randolph was um, a, a Washington insider, as we would say today. Uh, he was an advocate with uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, for the rights of African Americans, which had been routinely trampled. Um, he pushed, for example, for a federal lynch law uh, that would, would make it a federal crime to lynch someone. Uh, taking it out of the hands of local or state constabularies who were notorious for not enforcing lynch laws uh, on the books and murder laws on the books. Um, nevertheless, um, Philip Randolph saw his opportunity and pressured uh, Franklin Roosevelt to desegregate defense contracts and desegregate uh, the military. Uh, he demanded, for example, the establishment of a Fair Employment Practices Committee, uh, and his threat was to bring marchers, like Core would have done, to Washington, D.C. if he did not uh, get what he was after, this establishment of a Fair Employment Practices Commission. And so uh, Roosevelt indeed gave in, established the Fair Employment Practices Commission, which had no real teeth until uh, Harry Truman um, used that as part of his fair deal um, uh, program uh, later in the 1940s. Now, African Americans, hang on for a second. Remember that March on Washington movement. It blitz up 20 years later. Uh, and A. Philip Randolph is part and parcel of what we remember as Martin Luther King's March on Washington. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, but that March on Washington in August of 1963, for which we remember King's I Have a Dream speech, was really an extension of the Randolph March in the 1940s, the movement that never materialized. Um, and, and like I said, we'll talk about that at a later time. Uh, African-American um, troops proved that they were, um, I guess, worthy, which is a terrible thing to say, but that's exactly what they were trying to prove, um, uh, that they were honorable, that they could indeed um, not only fight with great courage, which was something that, that a lot of white folks didn't think they could do, uh, but also that they were technologically capable. Uh, this was an old saw among, in, within the white community that, that African Americans simply were not technologically capable of doing things like flying aircrafts uh, or running tanks, um, doing anything but being mess stewards or, or um, uh, maybe uh, infantrymen. Um, Nevertheless, with the Tuskegee Airmen, also known as the Red Tails, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, uh, flying uh, fighter aircraft, most notably the P-51, uh, as bomber escorts, proved their worth. Now, it had been a, um, an accepted myth until just the past few years that the, the Red Tails, the 99th Pursuit Squadron, had never lost a bomber to enemy aircraft, but Dan Holman, a historian at Maxwell Air Force Base, looking at very carefully at the records, demonstrates that indeed the 99th did lose um, aircraft, did, did lose bombers that they were escorting to enemy aircraft. About 20 to 25. Uh, they lost, which is uh, still an incredibly small number. And what we can continue to say, however, 
is that the 99th lost almost none of those aircraft, as small a number as they, as they lost, lost almost none of those aircraft to um, hot dogging uh, and being tempted into breaking discipline and breaking formation. Maybe a few, but not very many. And this was a common thing among uh, fighter squadrons that Germans would bait uh, one or more of the members of the fighter squadron into a dogfight. And when that um, uh, squadron was tied up, they would attack with other airplanes. Um, the 761st Tank Battalion, known as the Black Panthers, were an integral part of the Battle of the Bulge as well and earned fame for that. Now, there were some uh, successes because of the changing of the time, and I think in large part because of um, the, the either activist activity of African Americans um, or their, uh, their success on the battlefield, which kind of softened um, uh, attitudes uh, toward them. Uh, the Supreme Court outlawed the all-white Democratic Party uh, primary in the South. The Democratic Party primary, the South is one party um, um, area. It used to be the Democrats, now it's the Republicans. It is not a two party area. Um, so that the primary is the, for all intents and purposes, for major state offices at least, the actual election. Legally it's not, but in actual practice it is. Whoever wins that primary, and in 1944, it was the Democrats, went on to win the election. Um, that whole white primary was outlawed by the Supreme Court in 1944, and race relations eased, but certainly by the end of the war, they remained strained. They were not as strained as after World War I. Well, with that, we'll end this lecture talking about uh, some of the things that occurred on the home front in World War II. Thank you very much for your attention, as always.